Yeah. Oh, the light. Give it one more second. Uh, good morning, Portsmouth. Uh, I'd like to call to order the November 3rd, 2022 Parking Traffic and Safety uh, Meeting. Uh, would you call the roll, please? Mary Lou McElwain. Here. Steve Pesci. Here. Mark Syracusa. Here. Harold Whitehouse. Here. Erica Wyganek. Deputy Police Chief Mike Maloney. Here. Fire Chief Bill McQuillan. Here. Public Works Director Peter Rice. Here. City Manager Karen Connard. Here. Chairman Andrew Bagley. Here. And um, Eric, would you pull up the financial report? Mr. Chairman, I'll move to accept the financial report. I'll second that. Yeah. All right. Any discussion? Okay. Can we, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, public comment. Um, but just before we get started with public comment, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the article in the paper uh, about Harold Whitehouse yeah. and uh, his many, many, many decades of service to the community. And, and if you have a chance to go back and read that article, uh, I think it's pretty excellent. So with that said, uh, I'll open the floor to any public comments. In reference to that, uh, people have called me and asked me, what's the answer to the longevity? You know, I, I can't give an answer. I, it, mostly it's uh, in, the, in the genes. My mother was the same way, 97 years old, <laughs> reading without glasses, down to senior center every day, 97. Love it. That's excellent. <laughs> Very lucky. Nice photo, too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, my name is John Tabor, uh, and I live at 55 Pleasant Point Drive. Um, and uh, if you haven't read Harold's book, go to the library and get a copy. It's wonderful. Um, I wanted to suggest an idea for parking traffic and safety that came out of my discussions with um, Matthew Glenn and Doug Roberts and others uh, involved in the bike community. Um, <clears throat> The idea that I would propose that you take up and uh, deliberate about would be a, a city bike riding scorecard, uh, which would give us metrics of bicycle usage, um, as well as progress on the bicycle network as it's envisioned in the bike bed master plan. Um, we have monthly review of crash data at PTS. Um, but do we regularly review trends in bike usage? Anecdotally, it seems like it's rising. It certainly rose a lot during the pandemic. Uh, we now have e-bikes. Um, and, and where is it increasing? Uh, we have parts of the city like the new playing fields at the community campus or um, growth of the West End uh, and condos and apartments there. So are we seeing increases in certain parts of the city? Um, so fundamentally, I would ask the PTS consider a regular scorecard that shows, that yields the data um, of how our bike ridership is trending, up, down, and where, and even some demographics. Um, you know, um, we're becoming a work from home city. And is that creating more daytime ridership, family ridership, outside of commuter hours? So all these were uh, ideas that we uh, discussed. And the idea of a scorecard, I think, would yield regular visibility towards our ridership in the city and valuable data when the council has to make policy decisions about uh, complete streets and, and bike paths. Um, and, you know, what gets measured gets attention. Uh, if we have a regular update on our bike usage around the city and where that network may be deficient, that's a signal to us that the data is saying 
maybe we need to uh, uh, look at uh, speeding up aspects of the bike ped master plan wh where they may not have had attention in the past. So um, <clears throat> I think that uh, Mr. Eby and staff uh, would be the experts on what to measure and how to measure. I know um, the National <coughs> Association of City Traffic uh, Engineers, uh, NACTO, has a working paper on uh, making bikes count, effective data collection metrics and storytelling, uh, which may be a resource. Um, and uh, <coughs> so um, I would hope you'd um, take that up and it could be valuable for us all to see what our trends in ridership are. Thank you, John. Hi, uh, Doug Roberts, 247 Richards Avenue. Uh, I want to support what uh, John said and just add that um, bike and pedestrian uh, considerations uh, often get lumped together. But uh, a key obvious difference is that um, cyclists use the streets, and uh, which is why the, uh, this committee might want to uh, uh, follow up on John's uh, idea here. Um, it's a matter of safety. For pedestrians, you're separated, and uh, uh, cyclists have to mix with the cars. So as a traffic safety committee, uh, I think it should be a primary consideration for you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So, uh, good morning. Um, Matthew Glenn at 34 Harrison in Elwyn Park and a board member of uh, Seco Stereo Bicycle Riders. So. Um, I'm very much in support of um, <clears throat> better better metrics. Um, any any kind of data you can collect. Um, I also um, want to mention that there would be value in a uh, separate bicycle committee or bicycle and pedestrian committee. Um, and I don't mean that as a slight on the good work you do here, the very important work you do around safety. Um, but I feel that a um, a different group that was really focused on tracking how the bicycle pedestrian plan is coming along, what uh, progress can be made uh, reviewing um, road plans um, as they're getting repaved, uh, that there'd be a lot of value in that. This is something that was uh, one of the uh, um, high-valued recommendations in the 2014 bike ped plan, that there be a bicycle and pedestrian committee. And it's also been recommended by the League of American Bicyclists in their um, scorecard for Portsmouth. Uh, I think we're bronze level to, to move up to the next level. Um, so um, beyond that, I wanted to specifically today um, uh, speak about Sagamore Avenue. And uh, thank you for putting that on the agenda. Um, I would support um, staff looking into Sagamore Avenue as a whole, not just single spots, but um, see what can be done to um, uh, make it a better bike route. Um, as y you probably all know, it's one of the most popular recreational routes in the city, uh, the Newcastle Loop. I'm sure any of you who bike recreationally ride on Sagamore Avenue. Um, it's also an essential route for someone like me uh, commuting to work and other people I know in my neighborhood. Um, it has um, a relatively new bicycle lane part of the way. Uh, the bike ped plan calls for that bike lane to extend all the way to the Rye Line. Um, I recognize that there's limited right of way at the top of the hill there where the sewer project is uh, tearing up the road right now. So I'm just asking you to look at what, what can be done there, uh, knowing that um, uh, property lines may not allow for uh, full width bike lanes there. Um, I do appreciate. Um, I had been in communication with Eric um, months ago about a sign that says bikes may use full lane. So we do have that sign right there at Luster King. Um, what happens is the bike lane just um, shrinks down, the shoulder shrinks down. Uh, you've got a couple inches of shoulder. So bikes really have to be out there in the travel lane at that point going over the hill. And it's an especially dangerous spot because um, drivers are impatient to pass, but they can't see over the crest of the hill. Uh, they're often startled by oncoming traffic, and that causes them to squeeze back over against the bike riders. So um, 
you know, even more specific signage, um, you know, no passing, limited visibility, um, anything like that uh, that you might be able to consider. Um, Shara is painted uh, right there in the center at that point uh, where bicyclists have to be out in the lane. Uh, might be worth considering. I know that's just uh, paint. Um, looks like a bicyclist has been flattened when you see one of those, mm -hmm. but um, it's worth uh, uh, considering, I think. Um, beyond that, from Cliff Road onward, there's a pretty good shoulder and it is functioning as a bicycle lane. So I'm asking if that can just be labeled that way, if we can paint it as bike lanes both ways, uh, put signage up. Um, that seems like it should be a pretty easy win, especially with the uh, golden egg no longer there, um, no more weekend parking issues around the golden egg. Um, let's just make it official that parking shouldn't be allowed um, at that location. Um, there really isn't enough shoulder width for parked cars to not block the travel lane. So um, from the bicyclists I've talked to, um, they keep bringing up those two issues, the crest of the hill and um, the problem of parked cars at the Golden Egg as being the, the two big ones. Um, also talk to people who are uh, less confident. Um, the owner of uh, Port City Bike Tours said when she's taking a group, they really try to avoid Sagamore. Um, I spoke to someone I know who lives right at the top of the hill. She said she only bikes for exercise before 9 a.m. because she's afraid of the cars. And uh, I think with, with good reason, um, last April or May, a um, driver hit her retaining wall, went through her yard, through a fence, and into a tree. So um, obviously, um, she, she's also a supporter of any traffic calming, um, and anything, anything you can do there. So um, I, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Good morning. My name is Ann Cummings, and I live at 520 Sagamore Ave. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is I'd like to ask if these existing bike lanes, which, which end just past Little Harbor Road, be extended as far as they can go, hopefully to the Rye Town line. I know there's some areas where it's already wide enough. Um, paint some additional bike stencils in the existing lanes as well as repaint the ones that are there. They've gotten rather worn and they're kind of flaking. And I would also ask that the, um, the, the lines also be repainted as well. The other thing I want to talk about is, is um, speeding on Sagamore Ave has gotten absolutely horrible over the last couple of years. I live directly across from um, Sagamore Court and when, you, when I hear cars coming up the hill, going into town, when they get partway up, they start revving their engines and speeding like crazy. And they don't, they don't stop when they get there. They continue on around. And when they are coming from town, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> when they're coming from town, uh, they start speeding up when they go around that bend. I've seen almost, I, I've seen close to, two cars very close to hitting people in that crosswalk and even though there's blinking lights there and everybody waits sometimes a car will stop and let somebody go and then there's a car coming behind them paying no attention at all and the speed limit there we're the only place in town that's not 25 miles per hour yet we would really like to ask i would really like to ask that that be considered there the houses are very close on sagamore ave as you all know and a lot of us are close to the road, and there's also a lot of people who walk on those sidewalks, a lot of kids. And when you, if you could hear what we hear, and it's every day, and it's not normally in the morning or very early afternoon, it's late afternoon and at night, they come around there, and sometimes I just cringe because I feel like they're going to hit something and come flying over into somebody's yard, like was just mentioned, that happened down the road from us. So. Again, I'd like to ask that the 25 miles per hour be considered. Please, we're the only street in town that isn't that way, and that is a major route in and out of town. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Is there anybody on? We do have one person, okay. Peter. Okay. Peter Whistle is on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, go, go ahead, Peter. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Peter Whistle. I live at 579 Sagamore Avenue, Unit 75. Um, I really appreciate what everybody's been uh, saying to advocate safer roads for cyclists. I'm specifically concerned about that area um, at Luster King where the shoulder narrows to virtually nothing. 
and um, drivers really don't have enough room to pass a cyclist um, approaching that, that bridge there and leave the required three feet between their vehicle and uh, a moving cyclist who is likely moving pretty slowly going up that hill. I know in my case uh, that, that that's what happened. And um, just anything that can be done to um, increase the width of that shoulder or discourage drivers from trying to pass the cyclists at that point where they can't see over the, the ridge of any oncoming traffic. Um, I think it's just um, an, an area that um, um, just kind of lead to a terrible accident at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Is there any more? Uh, anybody else in the room would like to speak? Uh, with that, I will close the public comment. Mr. Chairman. I'd like to briefly address this concern relative to Sagamore. I was specifically at the Luster King area. Um, staff is very much aware of this challenge. We've been trying to address it for years. Um, we, as part of the sewer project, we added to the scope um, designed for that area, specifically from the deceleration lane going into Tidewatch all the way to the other side of the crest of the hill. Um, the, the challenge in that area, as people are well aware, is that you go from a relatively uniform width of the roadway with a, a, a nice uh, shoulder, which you, know, you could consider a bike lane, and then it widens up significantly for a deceleration lane. So cars, as they come to that corner, have this big wide space that they accelerate past L Luster King and then it chokes right down again. So two things we're looking at doing is keeping a more consistent road width and, and, and a bicycle or, or shoulder and then adjusting the travel lanes to maximize and balance the, the width of the shoulder on either side as you go over the hill. It does not make a, a bike lane. It makes a wider shoulder. Um, but we are looking at that. We, we have survey being done uh, to address this issue. And it's something that we're very much aware of. Um, and we don't disagree that we need to do make improvements. I personally have experienced um, the challenge of that area. Uh, my bicycle has um, scrapes and, and uh, my shoulder um, was, was sore for quite a long time. Uh, so I, I'm very much aware of the challenges a cyclist face, and I'm an avid cyclist. Um, so it's, I'm not afraid of traffic. Um, so, but to that, I just want folks to understand that we are aware of this and we are taking steps to address uh, these challenges. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, perhaps somebody might make a motion to suspend the rules so that we can address item B under new business first. Mr. Chairman, I'll suspend the rules to take up item B. Second. Second. Call those in favor? Aye. 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 I got a okay. question for Peter. Uh, let me okay. just read the, the what we're going to address in them because it, it relates to what Peter just discussed. Uh, so new business uh, item B is Sagamore Avenue request to extend bike lanes from Little Harbor Road to Rye Line by Seacoast Area Bicycle Riders. and. Sample motion is moved to refer to staff for evaluation and report back at future meeting. Second. Or make the motion. I'll second. Okay. okay. And then I'll open it up to discussion with uh, you first, Mark. He just answered my first question. Do we have a CIP on Sagamore Road to address that hot spot by Lester King? And you just brought it up. We're, we're, it's in, we included it as part of our design. Right. Um, so it's not specific, but there are other monies that overlap that type of activity, so that's where we're using the money from. My second question was on, uh, on between, my understanding is between the Wentworth Road and the border in Rye, that that's state property? You are correct. It's not the city compound. So compact. do we have any any right to, can we put a bike lane at from that distance from Wentworth to there? I, I don't, I think About, we could work with the state to do that if necessary. Um, I don't see that as being the challenging section of the roadway. So, uh, you know, whether we label it or not, it still functions uh, very well as a bike lane. It's, it's uh, plenty of shoulder width, and I don't think that's the issue. Um, you know, we, if people want a designation and, and formalize it, um, I believe it's actually on the state uh, bike routes as a designated bike route already. So, you know, if the states, if we ask the state to get some signage up, I, I don't think I think it's a reasonable request. So that was my question. Do we have to work with the state on that? And outside the city com compact, yes. Right. That's it. Uh, Harold. Yeah. In, in reference to uh, speed on a state highway, uh, there's certain restrictions that we 
can't touch at all, is there? Or, the, or, or what's the late, latest on state highway in reference to speed? Is I would have there? to defer to Eric on that. Yeah. Yeah, but for the state portion of the road, they, the state sets the speed limits, and we don't have say over that. Of the, of the city portion of Sagamore, we can set the speed limit, but no lower than 25 okay. per state law. It's currently set at 30 miles per hour. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve? I, I just would ask that when the staff reports back, we, we look into the uh, issue that was raised about on-street parking in the former Golden Egg area as well make that part of the review mm -hmm. Erica um, I have a handful of questions I assume if it's being taken up as part of a design a lot of my questions would be resolved there so I won't go through those now um, I did wonder um, the deceleration lane for Tidewater I don't know if that's really Tidewatch I don't know if that's really needed but I also don't know if it's part of their permit you know, if it was part of their application requirement, and I think back that, in the 80s, it, yeah. So and we could change that, I think. So, Mr. Cherry, we, you know, our plan is to come back to the to the committee once we have uh, a design. Um, I, I'm cognizant that that may be some reasoning behind it, but that does not mean um, a, a change is not appropriate. There's no reason you don't need to decelerate on a, a 25, 30 mile an hour roadway I to agree. get to do a right hand turn. I think right it's helpful turn. for traffic calming. To have vehicles turning um, and I guess related to the parking at Golden Egg I don't know what was in the permit for that construction project we should probably look at that because maybe the on-street parking was part of their I mean you can't get credit for that but I don't know if it was I don't believe right? uh, we can check but we'll have it report, report back I mean it's already it's yeah. already something that we were aware of it's come before us before yeah uh, and the reason it wasn't um, signed as no parking was because the Golden Egg had came out and said they wanted that parking on on street. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, I don't, there shouldn't be as much of a need for on street parking when that. Yeah, they have their own parking lot. Right. Right. Any further discussion? Um, I just have a couple comments. So I did actually go out by where the Golden Egg is, and just before, well, I guess where the Golden Egg was, there is a no parking sign that's completely faded. Um, so I presume from that sign, which. Um, as you're coming into town is on the, you know, before you get to the Golden Egg, that sign probably could be replaced um, because as, as it stands now, it's, it's, it's just a white sign and you can only read the lettering if you look very Mr. closely. Mr. Chairman, I, I recommend um, staff review what the ordinance says relative to no parking and not. It may have been a sign that was erroneously put up without any authority to, to do that. Okay. So I would think if we treat this as a comprehensive um, look at that section of the roadway, and you know we could propose to to clean it up, um, and either either restrict parking via ordinance, or or just make it more consistent with the ordinance. Okay, that sounds like a good way to do it. And I guess um, uh, I I would probably support the no parking uh, sign. However, it might be helpful um, to reach out to the the business condos across the street because I do know that um, the kids in town really like to use that area as a swimming hole which we discourage mm -hmm. um, but it seems like they're going to continue to do that so we don't want to create a situation where if that parking is already being used it now shifts to their <coughs> parking lot so I think it would be better to to address it with them first and then put up the signs rather than just put up the signs if if at all possible Eric if, you know why don't we just look at that the whole area you know frankly I I wouldn't do anything to encourage people from jumping off that bridge <laughs> um, and, and I appreciate it's a rite of passage I understand my kids did the same thing um, but it's not something that we as a city can encourage no I wouldn't want to do that and, or, and or I facilitate a, in any manner I have a daughter who's <laughs> at the age of jumping off the bridge and we yeah. have that discussion every summer Tell her to so. ride a bike <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and then I just I just want to thank all the citizens for coming in and speaking to this. Um, in some offline conversation, I think this might be the appropriate time to say it. There there was some suggestions that maybe this committee could have a uh, a bicycle member or a saber member, um, and, and I would be opposed to uh, adding a a saber member or any other uh, organization member as a as a representative. I think the proper role for this community is is to look at all the problems as a whole not from any uh, particular angle and then the proper venue for for an organization like Sabre or, or any other organization would be to come to public comment or to send in requests or 
if they feel that we could benefit from a presentation, uh, we, we would certainly schedule that in. Um, and with that noted, I would say, um, you know, uh, Mr. Eric Eby is, is, rides his bike everywhere in town. Uh, as Peter Rice mentioned, I, I think not only were you a founding member of Sabre, um, but you're an avid cyclist. Um, and I know others on the committee as well as myself are avid cyclists. So I, I do think we have representation um, from the cyclist uh, community, um, but I don't think having a designated uh, committee member that represents one interest above others is a good practice. I'd much rather see it where um, people that are representing a specific interest come in and speak to us or come in and, and give a presentation, and then the committee evaluates that information um, looking at the city as a whole and not in, in any particular lens. Uh, Erica? Um, on that topic, I, I do know a number of cities and towns have dedicated bike ped committees, and my understanding was the request was not for a dedicated member here, but to have a committee dedicated to that. Um, I do feel like parking and traffic safety is not a bad spot to take on those topics. Um, I, but maybe it's just me, but the title, Parking and Traffic Safety, certainly communicates a lens of very vehicular-focused, motor vehicle-focused. I don't think that's the lens most of us come in with. Like, I think we do try and be pretty balanced. I don't know what the rules are for changing the name of things, but maybe there's room to reframe this committee to be clear that it's meant to be modally inclusive. I think that's worth considering. Do you have? I, I'm comfortable with that. My, my concern about creating a separate committee is that we already have, uh, you'd have overlapping um, interests mm -hmm. and, and it, it I, I personally don't have an issue with having, you know, a de, you know somebody that speaks for the, the, the com that community um, on the committee. But, you know, I, I'm sensitive to what you're saying, um, that we're supposed to be inclusive and no special interest in one way or the other. Um, I, th I think, you know, similar to what we've done with the speeding, um, citywide speed limits, um, it's, there's a possibility of a working group, creating a working group uh, that focuses on bicycle, pedestrian, um, and, you know, that would allow for that voice to be heard a little more clearly. One of the things that we're looking at, at doing um, in this year's, um, mm -hmm. through the CIP, we, we set aside money every year to implement uh, bicycle pedestrian related um, infrastructure and upgrades. That includes master plans. Uh, the last master plan was 2014. We did an update, which was really a, more of a status a report back in 2019, I think. Um, and I think it's appropriate to, to revisit that master plan. Um, and, and try to focus, um, you know, the, the initial master plan helped uh, raise awareness, but I think it's appropriate um, to start looking at uh, updating that master plan. And that's a great opportunity for interested cyclists as well as folks who uh, advocate for pedestrians um, to participate uh, in that process um, and then have it come through, you know, have that initiative really come through the committee. Um, it's a planning exercise to a, to a large extent. Um, However, I think it's, you know, given the changing demographics, given, you know, the, where we're at in the world, um, it's appropriate to brush that off and to kind of revisit um, at a, and get more public input um, again. So that, that's, I just, I, I, you know, more just like filling in the, the gaps between some of this, you know, things. It's, I mean, it's important for folks to understand that the, the bicycle pedestrian um, master plan is a, wor a living document. Eric does refer to it on a regular basis, and, and, and Matt does a great job, um, you know, keeping us honest uh, by, by making sure that, you know, we, we're trying to pay attention to it. Uh, it's challenging from an impl implementation standpoint to be able to do everything um, for the implementation of that. There's, there's roadway widths, there's times when we're doing just pavement, um, and we're not doing roadway reconfigurations. Um, so it seems like, well, we paved, why didn't we? create a change, it wasn't necessarily that that vehicle wasn't necessarily the right approach to, to making those changes. But it's important to, to keep in mind that it takes time to, to, to do this type of thing. And, you know, we are making progress, but it's good to have advocates to, to keep a gentle hand on our back um, to keep us going in the right direction. So that's just general background and, and where, where staff is thinking and what direction we've received from council. And, 
Mark. Uh, Peter just answered my question that Matt Glenn Saber letter here that I read, uh, bicycle pedestrian plan. So it's 2014, so it's nine years old almost. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was going to be my question, but you just answered that. Yeah. So yeah, so it's 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 due for an overdue to a, you know, to address. So, yeah. I, I appreciate those comments, Peter, and, and we're, we're probably a little bit far from where the the motion that's on the table is. But I, I will um, perhaps suggest, you know. Uh, it's been 10 years or almost 10 years maybe this committee could recommend to to council that we address this issue um, and we set up a working group of members of this committee to um, I guess we would have a 2024 bike ped plan or, or something like that so I guess my question maybe to the city manager is, is what's the proper way if we wanted to put that into action how would we go about it um. Why don't you let Peter and Eric and I make a proposal on that, on how we would best roll that forward? I think it would be a CIP element. Yeah, which which is kind of the direction we've been going in because we have that CIP element right now, and right. the way we've structured it this year is is referring to the master plan and a need for an update. There's been a number of resident requests um, relative to bicycle pedestrian, a number of them from from Saber, Matt Glenn. Um, and really, we our response is like, okay, this is really good stuff, but it needs to be done in the context of the overall master plan and how do we, you know, and, and updating it is part of that. The committee's role um, would, tip, it would typically be run by uh, city staff with a working group uh, giving input to that process. So um, the manager and Eric and I will will sit down and put our heads together and, and report back. Okay, excellent. Good. All right. Um, One more thing for what it's worth. I agree with Eric's comment that perhaps we consider renaming the committee yeah. to have it more holistically reflect what it is we're advocating for, looking out for, and maybe the, you know, maybe we can come up with things uh, at a future. Any, any suggestions? <laughs> I, right off the bat, I turned traffic into roadway, but that doesn't, I, I, I don't know. Please, so we get, we get so traffic, in my mind, means pedestrian, pedestrian, cyclists, and motorists, mm -hmm. where you're saying it's more limited to... No, I, I agree with you, but I think that connotation of parking and traffic safety together it I think the sorry is it okay if I yeah sorry yeah. um terrible at that uh I think by the like dictionary definition yeah it's inclusive but I don't think it gives the feeling of that sort of comprehensive we think about everything it, Mr. Chairman, maybe by leading with parking and that's cars more often than bikes. <clears throat> yeah. Let me. Propose, I, I don't know. I would yeah. propose for a, a future meeting, if if not December, uh, soon thereafter, a conversation devoted to the name of the committee, and and so that people can come prepared with their thoughts. Yeah, I, I think probably leading with parking, and um, you know the amount of time we spend on the neighborhood parking program. There's there's a lot of. I think the city wants to embrace all modes of transportation as best we can, and, yeah. and name changes to reflect that would be helpful um, yeah. just to put us in the right frame of reference um, we're not taking any more public comment Could I, sneak in one thought? Yeah. I move to allow um, comment out of order I'll for a second yeah. all those in favor hi I, I, we have a motion on the table oh yeah um, we should dispense that there you go yeah, thank you sir all right well I'll, I, does anybody need us to go over the motion again or if you could um, <laughs> I believe the motion is to refer to the conversation relative to Sagamore Ave to staff for evaluation and report back at a future meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Matt, please come up. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just quickly back to Sagamore. Uh, it was in my letter, but I wanted to mention um, an update on the sidewalk extension. If that's um, when that's planned for, and what kind of space that would allow for um, mm -hmm. bike lanes there. Um, but thanks for the great um, discussion, everyone. Uh, this would make a great transportation committee, I think. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll put out there before we move on to the next agenda item, um, if members of the public have suggestions on names, uh, don't be shy about sending them in because you might come up with something better than, than what we come up with internally. So. Um, and just as a little historical note, that it used to be two committees. There used to be a parking committee and there used to be a traffic safety committee, and then they were merged to become this one committee. So. Right. I think having one committee address everything makes the most sense from a logistical standpoint. If you have competing committees, 
it just gets hard to keep track of things. But with that said, let's move on to item A, um, Broad Street request to move no parking signage further back from South Street by resident. And the sample motion is move to relocate no parking here to corner signs 30 feet from crosswalk, crosswalk on the north side of South Street. So moved. Second. And Erica? I think we were talking about the south side of South Street, though, aren't we? Oh, no, 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 you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I get very similarly confused with <laughs> yeah. professionals in that part of town. Right. You may have heard my pause as I was reading the sample yeah. motion. Side of south Street. Is that right? <laughs> compass with you when you're walking around town. Um, I, I thought we had talked about, excuse me. Yep, Mary Lou. Uh, I thought we had talked about both sides of the street yep. moving. I, that was my recollection as well. well. So would that be a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. It would be. I'll second that friendly amendment. I guess you don't need a second for friendly. And then any other discussion? Mary Lou? Yes, I think visibility is a huge issue there. And we've talked about this, that the bushes at the corner on the north side are blocking visibility. And it was brought up that it certainly blocks it for kids coming down on their scooters, on their bicycles to school. Um, pedestrians so if there's any way that we can um, request that the homeowners cut back their their shrubs that would be very helpful in this situation Erica um, I think usually when we do a site visit somebody gives a summary mr. chair that, that is correct. Historically, we do, if it is a contentious discussion and the, the kind of a background of the, the ins and outs of, of where we're at. In this case, it was a pretty straightforward. Um, we actually had demonstrations of vehicles trying to get in and out at the time. Um, so there, I, I don't think there was any dispute relative to the action. I just think it's nice for the record to... As a follow-on to that, Mr. Chairman, I think it was very helpful to have the side visit uh, to see as a group what we were able to witness. It would have been hard to theorize what the, the issues were, and, but we were all able to see it quite clearly. So I uh, appreciate um, the opportunity to see it before we had to debate about it. Uh, Harold? Yeah. yeah. So what jurisdiction do we have in reference to uh, obstruction from, from shrubs? Uh, do we just talk to the owner? Uh, all over the city because it's happening mm -hmm. elsewhere too. Yes, yeah, so we have this issue at many intersections, limited sight lines, and our first step is to send the letter requesting them to trim back their bushes. I see. Um, but then if they refuse, then it does get a little tricky and legally, you know, what our options are after that point. We do have some ordinances and zoning that we can try to enforce. Uh, yeah. But a lot of times the bushes are in such a condition that if they are trimmed back, they could be killed by the, the trimming that would be necessary. So, and, and yeah. it just yeah. if you want to be detailed, the other issue is the fence because yeah. you're not going to move the fence. So yeah. if you look to the left, look to the right, it's yeah. difficult. Mm. I'm sorry. What? Oh, just I speak out of line. You just <laughs> have to go through the chair when you. Oh, I'm sorry. To be acknowledged. Sorry, Mr. Chair. But uh, continue, please. Oh, that was it. Okay, um, and and. Uh, is there any other discussion? I have a technical question for mm -hmm. Eric. Um, I believe the state ordinance is 30 feet, so that's, you know, if somebody requests, that's really the minimum that we have to do. In this uh, case, because it was it was pretty uh, obvious or apparent, at least to me, who was in the car trying to make a right-hand turn after the, the site walk, um, there was a pickup truck that pulled in, but only could pull in halfway. There were kids using both sidewalks, and then there was cars traveling to, good clip of speed on both directions on South Street. Is 30 feet sufficient? The committee thought about that because 30 is the minimum for state law, but in this case it may be worthwhile to push it back. But uh, Or we could do 30 feet and see how that works out. You know, you are eliminating parking as you do this, so it's a balance between safe operations of the intersection and, and accommodating parking needs on the street. So, I mean, this, this committee has the ability to set the parking restrictions as far as they want from the intersection. Mr. Chair, as I recall, um, we we said that we put the 30 foot in monitor. Okay. And yeah. then, you know, if, if you know if we felt it needs to be larger uh, or longer, we were going to report back, and then for further action. Okay. Uh, Mark, Mr. Chair. So, Eric, the question I have is, when you're heading south down Broad Street before you get to the shrubs and the fence, it if you have two vehicles on both sides of the road, it does narrow there, so you can only get really one vehicle. 
So going back as far as you can will get, allow access to go left or right mm -hmm. in a FESA. So yeah, I'm in favor of going past the 30 feet. But how do you address, could you address that with any, not paint or signage, but I guess not, because you know, if someone's coming off a right or left off the south and heading north, okay, there's a, a vehicle's coming the other heading south. You know, how do you, how do they manage that right now? Did yeah. you guys view that? Because you went at prime time at eight o'clock in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. During the week, so um, <clears throat> did, you, did you witness that at all? Anybody turning off and heading heading north? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it was so. It was one. But it was somebody coming south at the same time. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to envision? Yeah, yeah. There yeah. Was, it, the, 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 and the proposed solution is. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Uh, the proposed solution is to address exactly that. Yeah. So the, it, it, having additional space would allow the would have allowed the pickup truck to pull in, allow the the, north, the south driving vehicle on Broad Street to get past him. The the truck would then pull around them. So they didn't have enough. So they were kitty they were cut across the lane, which kind of created the gridlock situation. Um, okay. So it, it, the intent is to address that exact situation. Mr. Chair, and, Mark, and I like the idea of not going right to 40, go to 30, because let's see what kind of responses we get from the butters. You don't know what their needs are. And you're going to find out maybe some kind of reaction, maybe not. Yeah. And, and, and I did include, I don't know if this worked for you when your packets that were sent out, but we did have a video camera out there and we were, we found this condition where someone's pulling out, trying to pull in at the yes. same time, you know, they have to wait. To, yeah. yeah. So it's a... It doesn't happen frequently, but you know, when it does, it, it creates an issue and causes traffic tie-ups on South Street as well. Mary Lou? Yes, and the car is leaving Broad, uh, Broad Street, turning right, come onto the crosswalk, as this car does. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> trying to get out of the way and, and walking the crosswalk. Trying to get out of the, the visibility walk. issue. Yep. There's, there's a lot of that. <laughs> we have that in Ellen Park, everywhere. and there's, yeah, yeah it's right. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the motion on the table is to, to approve and then monitor to make sure 30 feet is sufficient. Yep. I'll second. second. No. Uh, uh, Steve has. Just to be sure, it's both sides of Broad Street. Right, yes. Yes. Both the motion. Right. Uh, <coughs> clarify again, both sides north and south? Of no, no. South. Yeah. I think we, we settled on both sides north of South Street. Okay. <laughs> both sides of Broad Street north of South Street. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, so moving on to old business. Um, item A, Maple Avenue at Prospect Street. Report back on the request to slow traffic on Maplewood Avenue. And the sample motion is moved to place on file. So moved. Second. And Eric, do you want to speak to this one? Yes. Uh, we've been out there and looking at this intersection. Uh, you know, the concern is vehicles coming out of Prospect Street have limited sight lines looking to the, the left towards the, the bypass over the bridge. And um, vehicles coming off of the Thanks. northbound ramp from the bypass don't always stop at the stop sign here. They come around this corner, you know, 10, 15 miles an hour. And uh, it can be a little tricky for someone pulling out of here. So we did traffic counts. We saw that at most there's only six vehicles an hour coming out of Prospect. It's a very low volume street. Um, sight lines approaching the street from, from Maplewood Ave are fine. It's on, you can see over 400 feet, which is suitable for speeds of 45 miles an hour, actually. Um, the, the one issue is when you're pulling out of here, your sight line's a little bit limited by the corner of this building. But if a vehicle pulls up to the edge of the, the white line here, then they can see beyond the building and they can see everybody that's coming. Even if someone's coming off the ramp here at 15, 20 miles an hour, they have time to see and react to someone pulling out of this intersection. So. Uh, I mean, the request is to slow traffic on Maplewood to make it easier to get out, but you know there are sufficient sight lines that everybody can see each other and, and stop even at the, at the speeds they're currently traveling. To make any changes to this ramp here to try to get people to slow down or stop, it, it would require working with the state, you know, try to put a bump out here or something that trucks could get over but would stop vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, working with the state to, to Modify this ramp would be a considerable effort. We, we tried it when they were redoing the Maplewood Ave Bridge, and we were met with pushback at that time. Um, vehicles coming out of Prospect, they do have the option of two other streets in the neighborhood that come out on the Dennett Street, yep. so it's not their only option for getting out of this neighborhood. 
<coughs> so uh, that's the reason I didn't suggest or recommend any actions at this point. To uh, you know, we did put this warning sign up a few years ago that warns people coming off the ramp or approaching that, that there is a side street here that's hidden behind this building. That uh, you know, we didn't see it rising to the issue of having to do some more measures out there at this time. And we are always trying to slow speeds here. We do have a your speed sign just beyond Prospect Street as you're going down the hill on Maplewood. So people are aware of their speed and trying to slow down as they're coming down the hill. Great, thank you. Any discussion? Is there a motion? Yes, to place on, place file. on file. Okay. Yes. All, right. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, old business item B, Marriott Drive, speed analysis, uh, sample motion, move to place item on file. So moved. Second. And Eric, would you speak to this one briefly? Yes, this uh, request came out of a neighborhood meeting in Maple Haven, uh, concerns about speeds on Marriott Drive. So we've uh, put out our stealth speed recorder on a couple places on Marriott, and we found the average speeds were 16, 85th percentile was 21, it's posted at 20. Uh, that was the slower, the, the faster section of Marriott, they were actually driving an average speed of 20 with an 85th of 26. So slightly over the posted speed limit, but still well within range. It doesn't suggest that uh, traffic calming measures are needed in this area. The speeds are not that great. Great, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And old business item C, uh, Maple Haven stop sign analysis. And the sample motion is moved to approve installation of a stop sign on the northbound leg of Suzanne Drive at intersection of Suzanne Drive and Simmons Road near Park. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Eric, if you could give just a quick. Yes, uh, th this request also came out of the, the Maple Haven neighborhood meetings. And there was some concern about these intersections within Maple Haven that are kind of confusing. if you, not familiar with the area. Uh, none of the none of them currently have stop signs, and because of the geometry, you're on the main what appears to be the main road of Suzanne Drive. You're actually coming to a T intersection with Simons, and your natural reaction would be to stop at this location. That's why the recommendation was for a stop sign here. Uh, you also have the park here. We have some people out of the side of the neighborhood coming in and may not be familiar with how the intersections work, so that was why we had the recommendation here. Uh, these other locations are can be somewhat confusing, but in the, the videos that we've put up at these locations and watching the traffic, it was very rare to have two cars at one time approaching these intersections. There's just not a lot of traffic in this neighborhood. So, you know, we could put up signs for the sake of putting up signs, but I'd prefer not to clutter the neighborhood with signs that aren't really needed. And I see that the one location that could be needed would be this one up here if uh, it was desired to put a stop sign in. We are putting a couple of speed tables in next year to control. There is a cut through issue, traffic coming off of Route 1, coming up through Suzanne Drive and out onto Ocean Road here to avoid the signal at uh, Lafayette and Ocean Ride. So those speed tables should address that cut through concern. Any discussion? Second. In, in, in reference to the speed table, um, yes. is, is that in the capital budget already? Do you know? Do you know? Uh, it's already covered by existing funds. Okay, I see. All right. And, and I'll just speak to, I, I think the intent of this request was to slow traffic. Um, and in this neighborhood, cut through traffic on Suzanne Drive is, is probably the chief complaint. Um, but if you look at the way traffic regulations are, if we were to put two stop signs in the, the area there on Suzanne Drive and on Simmons Drive, it would actually have the opposite effect of what I think the resident uh, was looking for because it would stop traffic and in um, that was in the neighborhood and give priority to the cut through traffic which is is probably the opposite of, of what they would like to see happen so I, I agree with Eric that you know putting stop signs in those two locations would be probably counterproductive and no further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all right moving on in our agenda is informational items, uh, the monthly accident report from police. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In September, we had a total of 77 crashes. 48 of those crashes were reportable. We did not have any crashes involving pedestrians or bicyclists, thankfully. Um, I will just note that uh, we have seen uh, an uptick in DWI and impaired driving and also DWI and impaired crashes. Um, these are oftentimes officers uh, coming across or get called to accident scenes 
and uh, the driver is impaired. Uh, in the last couple of months, we've seen a significant increase in that, and we're increasing our uh, dedicated DWI specific patrols here over the next couple of weeks and months. Mary Lou? Yes, I have a question about distracted driving. Um, I see a lot of it. I was almost hit on South Street yesterday by a, it wasn't a young kid driving the car. And uh, so I'm just wondering, what's going on with distracted driving? Are you t stopping? How do you, after driving, are you t stopping? How do you, how do you, you know, yep. how do you enforce that? Um, we conduct motor vehicle stops for distracted driving. In, in Distracted driving, you can uh, look at the definition of the RSA, is, is, is any momentary use of a portable handheld electronic device, uh, even temporarily halted in traffic. So even if you're at, everybody sees that light turn from red to green and then there's one car that doesn't move because the head and eyes are down and they're on their phone. So even that temporarily halted in traffic is considered distracted driving. Um, we stop a lot of cars f uh, for it. Um, we have made a difference, and I see it all the time as well. I've, I talked to an officer the other day, and, and he works nights, and he said, uh, he said, I used to stop cars a couple times an hour for distracted driving. He says, I don't see it. This is one officer, but he says, I don't see it as much as I used to. <clears throat> uh, during the day, I think we all see it on a steady basis. Um, I've personally written, the, uh, I don't know how many tickets for it. Um, the problem is until people consciously decide to change their behavior, they're going to do it. I've written people for a second and third offense. It's part of culture. It's part of, it's, a lot of cases, it's almost impossible for people to stop doing it. Uh, but we stop a lot of cars for distracted driving. Mm -hmm. We have specific distracted driving patrols, like the DWI patrols, where for three to four hours, officers go out, and that's their primary focus, distracted driving. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also probably the second highest contributor to our crashes, driver inattention or distraction. Right. Um, right. Because it's, there's nothing more dangerous than your head and eyes are in your lap when you're driving. So. I agree. Yeah, we, we, we do see it and we do, we do write tickets for it. And on we top of it. Stuff. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. All right, and uh, moving on, thank you for the report uh, to miscellaneous. Uh, the only t Go ahead, Mark, I speak. Uh, the only time we want to bring up is, uh, whoa, is uh, Assistant Mayor Splain reached out to me about Jessica's Law and uh, wanted to bring awareness to the topic coming into the fall winter season. And uh, I'm just going to ask Chief Maloney, uh, what's the policy on Jessica's Law? He just elaborated on it. It's that random, you know, that special enforcement. So after a snowstorm, What's the policy with your police department? Uh, the policy is just uh, we don't have a policy on Jessica's law. It's a motor vehicle offense. So just like any other motor vehicle offense, it would be considered a traffic violation. So uh, great reminder coming up on frost and frost season here in, in snow and ice. Uh, we do routinely put out on our Facebook um, in our social media about the awareness of Jessica's law. That's primary, our, usually our focus for kind of laws that people might not know about, whether it be uh, um, usually uh, awareness, education, and enforcement is usually the, the, the steps that we take. So um, that, that's a good reminder here now that the weather's getting colder is to, to clear snow and ice from windows so you have visibility. And your roof. M Mr. Chairman, just, roof. just as a reminder to the public, Jessica's law is a law where when it snows and you have snow on your, on your vehicle, that it should be taken off because it's a hazard. So when you're driving and it blows off, that's what causes deaths and accidents. Uh, and one of the ideas that uh, Jimmy mentioned to me when he called Splain um, is I mean, when it comes to awareness, um, we do have a newsletter um, that the manager puts out that maybe in the wintertime uh, we can increase that awareness to the, to the public it would be a nice idea. And, uh, you know, if there's any other ideas when it comes to justice law, it's very important for uh, you know, for safety, and you see it all the time, you know, especially with the people that don't have garages. Um, you know, they just drive to work and they don't clean off the, the tops of their vehicles. So um, the winter is coming, and there's, what do, you, what do you estimate, what, five or ten snowstorms a year, Peter? You don't know. Depends What's your average? You have an average. I know you have an average. Not off the top of my head. 
you know, it, it's, it, and it's not just snow, it's, you know, so we deal with precipitation events. So it's, it could be freezing rain, it could be snow, it could be, yeah. you know, so it's, yeah. you know, half dozen, dozen on average. Yep, yeah, yeah, even ice blowing off of vehicles, uh, so that's it. Uh, Steve? Uh, just a quick uh, anecdote from last week after our site visit uh, on Broad and South. I rode my moped on South Street heading towards Middle Street, um, and it's, it speaks to the speed limit issue. So that's a 20-mile-per-hour road. I was going 22, sorry, if my moped's correct, and had a vehicle pass at at least 25 to 30 across the so solid yellow line only so that I could meet them at their bumper a thousand feet down the road at the crosswalk with the uh, school crosswalk person. And I, I just want to encourage, uh, speaking of safety, I think there is this behavior that if you see a moped or a bicycle and your vehicle, you must pass them. Like you have to pass them even if they're doing the speed limit. And as we think about uh, updating our bike and ped plan and the e-bike issue obviously many e-bikes easily do 20 miles per hour or 25 some 30. of them 30 so i think it is time to update that plan uh, i want to just encourage people you know the speed limit is important but behavior i think you were speaking about distracted driving it's a behavioral thing and uh we all have to share these facilities and uh Anyway, that's my little soapbox experience for the week. So, <laughs> uh, Mary Lou and then yes, Erica. Just, just a quick comment, and I don't want to be a pill on this, but I want it on record that I think the three intersections at Maplewood, at Congress, Hanover, and Deer are not safe for pedestrians. So I want that in the minutes, please. Okay, thank you. And Erica? Um, just so Steve doesn't feel attacked on the moped. <laughs> I was driving on South Street in my car going 22 miles an hour, and someone passed me on a double line. On Crazy. South. On South. I mean, maybe it speaks to the point that if you have the speed limit too low, you are also creating a, you know, a safety hazard because of the way people are behaving. So it, mm -hmm. it speaks to that. It felt like I was driving appropriate for the road conditions at the time, but <laughs> the person behind me who kept honking disagreed. Impatience. All right. Um, seeing no further miscellaneous, uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Um, Second. Mr. Chair, right. the question about December meeting. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Peter. Um, so being that um, there's a lot of things going on in December and our agenda is a little bit light, uh, would this committee be opposed to us having our next meeting in January instead of December? Fine, Fine with that. I think it's up to the chair. That day right. would be Thursday, January 5th. All right, so we'll, we'll have the next meeting uh, Thursday, January 5th. And, um, you know, in the meantime, if, if people at home want to send us in suggestions on a new naming committee, uh, maybe we'll put something in the agenda where we can discuss that because I think there were some, some pretty good points brought up in public comment on things that we can do to be more cognizant of how to make the street safer for everyone. So I think it's something we should definitely look into. Great. All right. Good. Um, I guess with that, we'll adjourn the meeting till January. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.